The title of my message is Why Hanukkah Matters. Why Hanukkah Matters. And it's just going to be a very simple, straightforward message. But I wanted to talk about why we as Christians, followers of Yeshua, Jesus, why do we celebrate this so-called minor Jewish holiday? Why do we celebrate it? And, and is it really a minor holiday? I know it's commonly called a uh, minor holiday in Judaism and in Messianic circles, and obviously it's not prescribed in the Torah. The events that Hanukkah commemorates obviously happened way later than when the Torah was given. But I want to suggest that we shouldn't think of this holiday as minor at all. It's not a minor holiday. It's an incredibly important feast for us as Christians, especially in this day and age. But before we get there, I'm just going to give a, a quick summary of how Hanukkah came to be. Many of you are familiar with the story of Hanukkah. But for those of you who aren't, Hanukkah is a Hebrew word that simply means dedication. And it's the name of an eight-day holiday that we're celebrating uh, this year. It started on a Sunday for us, Sunday night. It's also called the Festival of Lights. And Hanukkah commemorates the deliverance of God's people and the rededication of the temple during the time of the Maccabees. So the, the two big themes that kind of permeate from this holiday are uh, rededication and, and light. It's the Feast of Dedication, the Feast of Lights. So just to give a quick summary, uh, a history lesson for you guys. In 167 BCE, the Syrian king Antiochus IV, one of the successors of Alexander the Great, he became ruler of the entire region of Judea. And during his reign, he harshly oppressed the Jewish people. Basically, what he wanted to do was to Hellenize them. That is, turn them into good Greek citizens. Antiochus didn't like that the Jews were different. It was seen as a, a threat to his, the unity of his empire. He didn't want any disruptions to the unity in the empire. Everyone had to be the same, okay? And the Jews were different, so they were a threat. Therefore, what Antiochus did was he outlawed things like Torah study, Sabbath and festival observances, circumcision, and so forth, basically all of the things that made God's people different, holy, if you will, set apart unto God. So the Syrian Greeks, they began oppressing the Jews. Second Maccabees goes on to tell us that they desecrated the temple in Jerusalem and they converted it into a temple for Zeus. What they did was they would have drinking parties and orgies with prostitutes in the temple. There's one story of Jewish women being arrested and thrown from the top of the city wall because they had their sons circumcised in accordance with the commandment. There's another story of Jews literally being burned alive because they were caught keeping the Sabbath. So this was not a good time for the Jewish people. The Syrian Greek rulers wanted the Jews to abandon their faith, at least certain aspects of their faith. They wanted to abandon their faith in the God of Israel and to fully conform to Greek culture. Now, at this time, many of the Jews did Hellenize and they did turn away from their faith. But there were a faithful few who said, no, we aren't going to compromise. And so there were these tensions that were building up and then they soon exploded into a full-blown revolt. Like I said, the Syrian Greeks, they did not tolerate any semblance of Jewishness, any semblance of holiness. The Jews were forced to be Greek or die. Eventually, Greek armies started going from town to town to force the Jews to eat pork and to worship idols. And then finally, a priestly family led by Mattathias and his son Judah Maccabee, they formed a small army and revolted against the pagan armies. The fighting between the small Jewish army and the Syrian Greeks lasted for about three years until the Jewish army miraculously forced the Syrian Greeks out of the region and regained Jerusalem and the temple. After they won the war, they started the process of cleansing the temple and rededicating it to the Lord. And that 
dedication ceremony lasted about eight days, hence the eight days of Hanukkah. This is what it says in 1 Maccabees 5, starting in verse 56. It says, so they celebrated the dedication of the altar for eight days and joyfully offered burnt offerings. They offered a sacrifice of well-being and a thanksgiving offering. Then Judas and his brothers and all the assembly of Israel determined that every year at that season, the days of dedication of the altar should be observed with joy and gladness for eight days, beginning with the 25th day of the month of Kislev. All right, so that's pretty much the story of Hanukkah. That's why we celebrate, and that's what we remember every year as we celebrate this feast day. It's an amazing story of a people remaining dedicated, devoted to God, despite extreme opposition. It also fits many other biblical patterns and themes of God's people basically having no hope at all, and then yet God divinely intervening, uh, miraculously delivering them when they should have been wiped out. But why should we as Christians care about Hanukkah? How, how is Hanukkah meaningful to us as believers, followers of Yeshua? Well, the answer to that question is multifaceted. Uh, I'm just going to give a summary of a few of the many reasons. First of all, without Hanukkah, as it's already been mentioned by a couple other speakers, without Hanukkah, none of us would even be here. Had Antiochus been successful in eradicating Judaism, there would literally be no Israel for the Jewish Messiah to be born into. In other words, there could never have even been a Christianity without a Judaism. So that alone, in my opinion, is reason enough to celebrate Hanukkah. Thank God for Judaism. Thank God that he preserved this people, that the Messiah that he delivered them, that the Messiah would come forth from this people so that we can be delivered as well from sin and death. And this is especially important for us to remember in this day and age, like I said. It's especially important for us to remember in this day and age because there's a rise of anti-Semitism. Just recently, there was an attack on a kosher deli in Jersey City, a, a member of the Black Hebrew Israelite movement, which if you don't know what that is, it's basically a racist and anti-Semitic cult. They believe that the Jewish people are not the real Jews, they're imposters, and that they're the true Jews. And so they have very anti-Semitic beliefs. And as we see, uh, you know, some people that are motivated by these beliefs take action based on those beliefs. And so one of these members of this cult murdered three Jews in cold blood. This was just about a month ago. And this was just the latest of several violent anti-Semitic attacks in just over a year. There were also two shootings in synagogues in San Diego and Pittsburgh. The Pittsburgh shooting, which just happened over a year ago, was the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in U.S. history. There's also been a rise in other anti-Semitic incidents such as harassment, vandalism, and assault, which have seen a 57% increase in 2017. Jonathan Greenblatt, the, the chief executive of the Anti-Defamation League, he recently said this. He said, it would appear these kinds of acts of anti-Semitism are now the new normal. These acts of anti-Semitism, these violent attacks, the harassment, the vandalism, it's the new normal in America. Now, don't even get me started on how even some of our congressional representatives in the U.S. are expressing anti-Semitic ideas and sentiments. A major political party in the U.S., which used to be very strongly pro-Israel, is increasingly turning against Israel. But what's most disturbing, more disturbing than all of that, all the horrible things in the world, are the so-called Christians, professing Christians, who run popular YouTube channels, who write books and so forth, bashing the Jews as being evil, as controlling the media and the government. Listen to what this wackadoo, best-selling so-called Christian author, Tex Mars, writes. 
He writes this in his recent book. He says, of all the diseased schools of racial supremacism, I am convinced that the Jewish specimen is the most evil and most threatening to the lives, bodies, and eternal destinies of mankind. Zionism has existed as a satanic ideological force in opposition to all things good and even to life itself for 3,000 years. The ultimate goal of the Jews is the annihilation of almost every Gentile man, woman, and child, and the establishment of a satanic Jewish-led global dictatorship. It's from his book, Blood Covenant with Destiny. Now that is some straight up Nazi propaganda right there. And it's from a professing Christian spewing this garbage. He's a best-selling author. And there's hundreds of thousands of people online that believe this garbage. I've even seen so-called messianics on the fringes of our movement who are very anti-Semitic. They express anti-Semitic beliefs. How many of you have ever heard of the, uh, the serpent seed doctrine? You've heard of the serpent seed doctrine? For those of you who don't know, uh, it's this evil, false doctrine that basically Eve had sex with Satan in the garden and that that's how Cain was born. So Cain is literally a child of Satan and that's where the Jews come from. There is an anti-Semitic teacher, a messianic quote-unquote teacher on YouTube who teaches this. Let me just say that anyone who harbors anti-Semitism or any other kind of racism or hatred in their hearts, they are not a follower of Messiah. They may claim to be, but they are not. They will go to hell unless they repent. And if you think that's harsh, take it up with the scriptures. 1 John 3.15 says that anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and a murderer has no eternal life residing in him. Hatred and racism and bigotry is completely incompatible with being a disciple of Yeshua. This anti-Semitic spirit rising up in our world today is contrary to Messiah's kingdom, which is made up of people from every tribe, every nation, including the Jewish nation. We're called to pray for this very kingdom to come. That's the prayer that you, our Messiah, our Jewish king, taught us to pray. Thy kingdom come. Who makes up the kingdom? Every tribe, every nation. Anti-Semitism is contrary to the New Testament. Yeshua said salvation is from the Jews in John 4.22. Paul said that the Jews are still loved by God in Romans 11.28, despite the fact that many of them rejected the gospel. He said they're still loved by God. He says in Romans 9 that God's divine promises are still theirs. He hasn't taken them away. God's divine promises are still Israel's. Anti-Semitism is against the very heart of our Jewish Messiah and King. So Hanukkah matters to us as Christians because it reminds us of the evils of anti-Semitism and how we are called to sound the alarm and stand against this evil in our day. Hanukkah inspires us to pray and to weep for the Jewish people that they would come to know their Messiah, that they would come to receive salvation. Hanukkah connects us as Christians back to the Jewish roots of our Christian faith. Our faith is based on the Jewish scriptures and a Jewish Messiah and Jewish apostles. And speaking of our Jewish Messiah, Let's talk about another reason Hanukkah matters to us. Hanukkah was important to Yeshua, Jesus. He celebrated it, as, as we know. There's a brief mention of it in the Gospel of John. And since Hanukkah was important to Yeshua, and Yeshua is important to us, what's important to Yeshua should be important to us. How many of you do things simply because it's important to your spouse or kids? Right? Right? My wife loves quality time. That is her love language. And that's not something I naturally think about, uh, you know, scheduling that quality time. But I do it because it's something that is very important to her. I go out of my way to make that time, that intentional time with her, because it's important to her. And obviously, when I do spend that intentional time with her, I'm really glad I did. It's a blessing. It's a benefit to me. It's the same thing with Hanukkah. 
This principle can obviously be extended to anything else in God's word. And this is something I think Hanukkah teaches us. This principle that what is important to God should be important to us. We ought to ask ourselves, what is important to God? Because what's important to him should be important to you. We are created to love him. Our lives are not our own. We're not our own gods. As uh, Ryan and Dina were just saying, you know, this, uh, this idea, the, this uh, beast system uh, is this idea that you are your own god, the 666 idea. We are not our own gods. We are created to love God. We are created to be a son and daughter of our Father in heaven, to serve him, to fear him. I was listening to a sermon by Francis Chan, and he was just talking about his experience being a Christian minister and being involved in this Christian culture for many years. Um, if you know Francis Chan, he's a, a, a popular Christian minister. Well, he was talking about his experience today versus his experience 20 years ago. And he talked about how it seems that it used to be the scriptures were much more revered 20 years ago than they are now, just in his experience. He says, it seems like there was just more reverence for the scriptures 20 years ago. It seems like there was more of a reverence and a fear of the Lord 20 years ago than there is now. Nowadays, Christians were just inclined to, to dismiss whatever we think hurts our feelings or is inconvenient in God's word. We like all the good stuff, and we, we like hearing that God is loving, and it's, he's merciful, and all of that stuff is great, and, and it, it is, it is great. I, for one, am very thankful for, for God's mercy on my life. But we don't like some other parts of Scripture. I'm talking generally. I'm talking generally. Many of us don't like to believe that God is a righteous judge that he is utterly holy, that we will be judged for how we lived. We don't like structuring our lives around God's holy standard and his guidelines. We want to do what we want to do. And it's easy to do. We justify ourselves. This is a human problem. We justify ourselves. I do it all the time. There's a, a band that I've been obsessed with, uh, they were like an instrumental indie math rock band. With this. It doesn't matter. Anyway, I really like this band. And uh, I found out that they were playing in Charlotte uh, coming up here pretty soon. So obviously I got really excited. I'm like, yes, I get to go see this band. I get to come see their show. Then I found out that it was going to be on a Friday night, which is uh, obviously when I keep Shabbat with my family. And that's a very special time that we've sanctified and dedicated to God and to each other as a family. So when I found that out, and I've been keeping Sabbath for a long time, but when I found that out, even still, my brain immediately started making justifications and excuses. No, they're not a worship fan. <laughs> But I, I immediately started making justifications in my brain. I'm like, well, you know, I don't want to be legalistic about this whole Sabbath thing. It, it's not really that big a deal. I mean, I could buy my tickets beforehand. I can hang out with my family, you know, earlier in the day. And it, it was just because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. It, it wasn't out of, you know, legalism that I wanted, you know. It, it was because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. We do this all the time because we don't have a reverence for God anymore. Let me tell you, God's laws will inconvenience you. God's laws will inconvenience you. Yeshua said that if you want to follow him, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow him. If you want to be his disciple, you must deny yourself. God demands you submit your life to him, your time, your talent, your money. How much do you give to the poor? 
to your local church, to ministries who spread the gospel, who do good work for God's kingdom, ministering to others? How much time do you spend in prayer and communion with the one who gave you life and who gave his life for you? How much time do you spend ministering to others, to the poor, the widow, and the orphan, even just your friend? How much time do you spend thinking about others, sending nice text messages to, to people you haven't talked to in a while, who might be going through a hard time, just letting them know that you care about them, that you love them? You know, I think, as I said, one of our big problems in Western Christianity is that we've sort of lost this sense of reverence for God. We've lost this sense of fear of the Lord and reverence for his word. Too often, I think we treat God as some sort of cosmic Santa Claus or butler whose job it is to serve us and to make sure that we are nice, happy, and comfortable in this life. We don't really see God as the sovereign king of the universe who is utterly holy and who demands that we deny ourselves, our dreams, our comforts, our preferences. We want to believe that we can just ask Jesus into our hearts, and that's it. Of course, you know, we'll, we'll attend church on occasion, go to some neat conferences sometimes, but we won't actually deny ourselves. You know, there's stuff in God's word that I don't understand. There's a lot of stuff in his word that I don't understand. There are some things that I don't even like, to be honest. I don't like that God judges the wicked. That doesn't make me feel very good. There are also things in his word that from my limited, carnal, human perspective, consider to not be that important. Why is this important? Why does God want me to do this? What's the point? I'm a 21st century American. This doesn't apply to me. And yes, there are weightier matters and lighter matters in the Torah, but the lighter matters are still important to God. Yeshua said to focus on the weightier matters without neglecting the lighter matters. There's the story in 2 Maccabees 7, a, a woman and her seven sons were being arrested and they were being forced to eat pork or be tortured and killed. And of course, they all refused to be unfaithful to God. They refused to disobey his laws. And therefore, each of them were brutally tortured and murdered as Jewish martyrs. Their limbs were chopped off. They were burned alive. As each of them were being tortured and put to death for their decision to be faithful to God's commandments, they would encourage each other to stay faithful. Listen to what some of these sons said as they were being put to death by the Syrian Greeks. Listen to what they said. One son, he was about to have his hands chopped off. And he said, God gave these hands to me. God gave these hands to me, but his laws mean more to me than my hands. And I know God will give them back to me again. Another son said, I am glad to die at your hands. I am glad to die at your hands because we have the assurance that God will raise us from the dead. Talk about faithfulness to the Lord. It goes on to say that the last brother was told that if he would only forsake God, if he would only disobey God, he would be given riches and fame and authority. He would even be given a title, friend of the king, if he would just forsake God. Otherwise, he would be tortured and killed. Those were his options. Do you want to be a friend of the king, or do you want to be tortured and killed for the sake of your God? He still chose death and thereby choosing to be a friend to the true king of the universe. Too many believers today are ready to give up on God the moment someone simply challenges them online. <laughs> you really believe marriage is between one man and one woman? What is this, 2008? Because, of course, Barack Obama even affirmed traditional marriage biblical marriage in 2008. 
You really believe that men are in fact men and women are in fact women. What is this, 2015? <laughs> You're such a hateful bigot. And then we're like, well, I don't want people to think I'm not nice. I don't want to offend anyone. Maybe I just won't mention any of those parts of God's word. Maybe I just won't openly affirm God's holiness in those ways. Just like in the time of the Maccabees, the world is demanding that we Hellenize. The world is demanding that we Hellenize. The world demands that we stop taking God so seriously. Of course, we can, we can have our little religion as long as we don't make other people uncomfortable by the truth that we affirm from God's word. Are you willing to deny yourself? Are you willing to deny yourself to follow Messiah? Because unless you are willing to give up your life for him, your dreams, your comforts, your desire to be accepted, your desire to not feel insecure and rejected, unless you are willing to give up your life for him, you can't be his disciple. He said, if anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves. And if you can't see by the way, how worthy Messiah is to give up everything for. You need to have an encounter with his holy presence, with his glory. The Jewish martyrs in 2 Maccabees 7, they understood how God is worth giving up everything for, and they lived and they died in light of that truth, that eternity with God is worth more than anything that this world has to offer us. So Hanukkah matters because it's important to Messiah. And since Messiah is important to us, what is important to him ought to be important to us. Another reason Hanukkah matters is that it's all about Messiah. It's all about Messiah. Yeshua fulfills the feast days, right? This is Messianic Theology 101. Yeshua fulfills the feast days. That is, he embodies them to their fullest extent, the meaning of the feast days in his life and his teachings. But wait, someone might say, Hanukkah isn't a festival in the Torah. True, but the scriptures still teach that Yeshua embodies the message and the meaning of Hanukkah along with the other festivals. For instance, in John 10, uh, it says that Yeshua went to Jerusalem for the Feast of Dedication. He pilgrimaged to Jerusalem for this festival. Now, John didn't mention this for zero reason. This wasn't just a neat little side note as a historical record. John is conveying a theological message here. Just as God delivered Israel in the time of the Maccabees, the scripture teaches that Yeshua is our ultimate deliverer. That as God delivered them, Yeshua delivers us from the oppression of sin and death. Also, Hanukkah commemorates the consecration of the temple. In this passage, John 10, Yeshua goes on to say that he is consecrated, alluding to himself as the ultimate temple of God. So Yeshua fulfills the purpose of the temple, which is to unite heaven and earth. It's to bring God's presence down to dwell among us. Through Messiah, of course, we also become extensions of this temple, bringing the light and the love of God to the whole world. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that on Sunday. But Yeshua fulfills the purpose of the temple. He is also uh, another theme of Hanukkah is light. And Yeshua also fulfills light. He is the light of the world. John says that Yeshua is the true light, which gives light to everyone. We are also called to be a light. So the meaning of Hanukkah is reflected in the person and work of Yeshua the Messiah. It's also reflected in his teachings. Look at what it says in 1 Maccabees chapter 3. 1 Maccabees chapter 3, starting in verse 42, it says, Judah and his brothers saw that the situation was becoming increasingly difficult as the military forces were encamped in their territory. They learned also that the king had commanded their complete destruction, but they spoke to each other, quote, let's restore our people after all they've suffered and fight for our people and the sanctuary. 
Let's fight for our people and the sanctuary. So the congregation gathered to prepare for battle and to pray and ask for mercy and compassion. So what was the primary motivation of these warriors? What were they fighting for? They were motivated by a love for their people and the sanctuary. And by the way, the sanctuary is simply a symbol. It's a symbol for God's presence among them. So in other words, everything that the Maccabees did was on the basis of love for God and their neighbor. That's literally the Jesus Creed. Yeshua said that the greatest commandment was to love God and love your neighbor. The entire Torah hangs from those commandments. So Yeshua's teaching here, it embodies the spirit behind this story. That true Torah observance, everything that we do, every way that we live our life, it must be on the basis of love for God and love for our neighbor. And that's something that we can take home with us. You, got, you ought to ask yourself, am I motivated by love for God and love for my neighbor? Is that my motivation? And I say that because there are a lot of people, I think, who keep Torah, quote unquote, not out of love, but because they just want to appear religious before men. That's not the calling of Messiah. He didn't call us to worthless religion. He didn't call us to just making a show out of what we do to be seen before men, going through the motions. He called us to a pure and undefiled religion, as James calls it, to visiting the widow and the orphan, keeping oneself unstained from the world. Yeshua said that our good works ought to testify of God's goodness so that others would give glory to him. Our works testify of God's goodness so that others would give glory to him. Torah observance is not meant to be a way for us to act religious for our own glory. We have a responsibility to reflect his life in this dark world that has lost hope, to cease to do evil, to learn to do good, to seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. That's our mission as disciples. We are called to lay down our lives for our neighbor. The Maccabees, they were called upon to lay down their lives for the sake of God's glory and for their neighbors. Likewise, Yeshua said that if we want to be his disciples, we must deny ourselves and be ready to lay down our lives. He said, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Another way Yeshua's teachings fulfill the Hanukkah story is in his call to be radically countercultural. Yeshua calls us to be radically countercultural, and that's, this embodies the Hanukkah story. The faithful believers during the time of Maccabees, they didn't care what the culture said, they held to biblical values, they stayed faithful to the Lord in spite of all opposition. In the same way, Yeshua calls us to stop caring about what the world thinks of us, to stop being led by our desire to be accepted, to stop being led by our insecurities and wanting to be liked. The Sermon on the Mount is the most countercultural sermon ever given. Based, uh, Yeshua says, blessed are the poor in spirit, Blessed are those who mourn, the meek, the peacemakers. When everyone else wants war, blessed are those who make peace. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you because your reward is in heaven. What? I'm blessed as I'm being reviled and persecuted? What did the Jewish martyr in 2 Maccabees 7 say? He said, I am glad to die by your hand. He understood this countercultural message that God is worth more than this world, that we are to live radically countercultural lives for his glory and his kingdom. The world tells us to give in to our anger. Every day there is a new outrage. Just get on Twitter sometime. Every day there's a new trending topic. We're mad at somebody new today. 
Somebody said something that wasn't politically correct or whatever. Someone did something. We're all supposed to be mad, cancel culture, all of that. The world wants us outraged 24-7. Yeshua, in his Sermon on the Mount, he compared anger to murder. He taught us not to insult or degrade one another. That when we give in to our anger, when we live in that, we, we are worthy of judgment. The world dehumanizes people. The world reduces women and men to sexual objects. Yeshua calls us to sexual purity. He calls us to elevate others, that people are not objects to be used for our own gratification, but that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. The world diminishes the value of marriage. Yeshua tells us to stay committed in our marriage, that marriage is worth fighting for, that it's worth keeping together. The world says we ought to hate our enemies. We're seeing a lot of this in the political climate, climate in uh, America today. Constantly have to be mad. We have to hate our enemies. We have to hate those who disagree with us politically, according to the world. Yeshua says to love your enemies. You can't get much more countercultural than that. And we can go on and on. One more way that Yeshua's teachings fulfill the meaning of Hanukkah is in his emphasis on repentance. After fighting many battles, the Maccabees, they found themselves in an impossible situation. The king commanded the complete destruction of the Jewish people, and the pagan armies were camped out all around them. So what did they do? What did the Jewish people do in this moment? They prayed, they repented, and they petitioned God. This is what it says in 1 Maccabees 3.47. It says, in deep mourning, they fasted all that day, put on sackcloth, threw ashes on their heads, and tore their clothes. Yeshua's ministry was centered around repentance. What was the first thing he said when he started his public ministry? At the very beginning of his public ministry, he walked around the Galilee and Judea declaring, Repent! Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yeshua calls you to live a life of repentance. We're all sinners. We all fall short. None of us are super religious or super holy. We need him. We need to confess our sins. We need to turn toward God. We need to make amends with those who, whom we've hurt. He calls us to stop living by our own standard, by our own desires, and submit to his standard. He says, not our will, but his be done. That's what Yeshua prayed, and that is what we need to pray, that it's his will that is to be done in our lives. The central message of the entire Bible is that we turn from our own way and that we follow God wholeheartedly. That is the basis of the new covenant established in Yeshua, that our sins would be forgiven, our iniquities would be forgiven, and that God would write the Torah on our hearts so that we would walk as a new people, as a new creation who loves him and who serves him wholeheartedly. Through Yeshua, we can be forgiven of our sins, and we can be given a new heart that yearns to obey God, that yearns to walk in holiness, that yearns to bring him glory. But it starts, it starts with realizing that we're not there yet. It starts with realizing that we are sinners, that we've messed up, that we need to repent. And so that's where I want to encourage you guys to start. I know we're already in the middle of Hanukkah. But I want, if you haven't fully submitted to Messiah, or if you've fallen away, I want to encourage you guys, don't let this weekend go by without going to him without confessing your sins, without rededicating your life to him. That's what this season is all about. It's rededication. I don't want you to miss out on this opportunity, what the, what the Lord is speaking to us through this holiday that we celebrate. Don't leave this conference this weekend without 
doing some introspection, without searching your heart, without asking the Lord, God, is there anything in my life that is holding me back, that, that, that's offensive to you? Lord, open my eyes to those things. God, am, am I not serving you fully in this area or any area? Open my eyes, Lord. Help me to see these things. That's the end of my notes, but I want to, will you guys join me in prayer? And we can just ask the Lord that he would open our eyes, that we would recommit to him. If, if that's you, if you've fallen away from the Lord, don't miss out on this opportunity. Maybe you don't even know of this Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, that I'm speaking of. Maybe you never really have come to know him. You've never really experienced his glory. You haven't come to feel his presence. That it would fill you up and it's more valuable to you than anything else. If that's you, I just want, I want to invite you guys to pray with me. Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful for who you are. We're just so, we're just so humbled, Lord, by your holiness, that you are the righteous judge, God. And Father, we don't have any right, none of us do, we don't have any right to stand before you on our own merit based on our own righteousness. God, you say that it's as filthy rags. None of us are righteous. We've all fallen short. We all continue to fall short all the time. But God, we are just asking for your help. We are asking God that you would divinely intervene in our lives. I pray for everyone here, Lord, that you would touch their hearts, that you would impact them in a deep and profound way that they would come to know you in a deeper way, that they would come to a new and deeper appreciation for your holiness and your love for them. God, will you write your Torah on our hearts? Will you fill us with your Holy Spirit that we would walk righteously before you, that we would bring glory to your name? Father, I pray for all of those who have, who have fallen away, who, who feel just depressed around this time of year, that feel lonely and, and broken. God, I pray that you would touch them as well, Lord, that your spirit would minister to them, that they would come to know that they are loved and that they have a place in your kingdom. Father, help us to be your hands and feet, that we that we wouldn't leave here unchanged, God, but that we would be inspired to go out into the world to correct oppression, to seek justice, to plead the widow's cause, God, that we would put our faith into action, that we would lay down our lives, that we would deny ourselves to follow you. We love you, God. And I pray all of this in your son, Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah's name. Amen.